Surviving in the D with Lee Lee comedy is life. What's up? What's up? Um, I apologize. I'm having a few unexpected technical difficulties, so my guest has not yet uh, been able to connect. Let me turn this fan off because I was probably too loud. <laughs> um, I'm supposed to be talking with Mike Jeter today, um, and I didn't want to not come on and come on late, but um, he just told me he was having some issues. Um, which he still is apparently having some issues. So I do apologize. It may end up having to be, um, might have to do this a different day. I didn't expect this to happen. Um, and I do apologize for those who said, I'm going to tune in, you know, um, whoo. You know, I could do a I could do a comedy set myself, but that's not what y'all came here for. And I don't have anything prepared for that, like in real life. Um hmm. interesting. So how's everybody doing tonight? Is everybody doing okay? How's everybody feeling? I don't see anybody in the room just yet. Um, and I apologize again. This this has never happened to me before. Um, oh, look, he's here. He is here. I see the beard. <laughs> so I'm going to bring on Mike Jeter. Um, hopefully we are all good. And um, let's get into this. What's up, Mike? Hey, what's going on? Nothing much. Woo. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. All right. Let, me, let me turn the light on so you can see my face a little bit. But I know yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Is there anybody? Bring a little bit of light to you. I'm just saying, is that good? Um, yeah. well, it's kind, of, it's kind of behind you, so you're still like not really oh, seeing. Let me, let me do this. And I'm probably sorry, I'm not prepared. <laughs> it's been kind of one of those. Hold on, people, good people. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Right. There we go. They got to see his beard. You know what not, I'm saying? Not, not, not. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are you doing tonight, other than having a weird day? I am uh, doing very well. Let me take these out because these aren't connected to the phone that I'm using. I'm doing well. I'm uh, very exciting times for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very exciting times. I'm uh, in the process of uh, uh, getting a home and uh, going through a divorce. Oh, wow. What else did I decide to pile on during COVID? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I listen, I'm, I'm an overachiever. I'm an overcomer. I, I, this is nothing. This is nothing. I'll get through this. A year from now, I'll sit back laughing and uh, reminiscing on how I uh, decided to do all this crap while the pandemic was going on. Hey, 2020 has been um, very interesting for many people. Right, very right. And it's just like, you know, it it's been some good things that happened for folks and then it's been some really bad things that have happened for folks so in in all of that i would would like to ask you like what how are you coping with it have you had any horrible things happen or oh boy oh uh, see for me 2020 is has been kind of easy mm -hmm. you know to be honest with you i mean yeah outside of comedy and not being able to do comedy uh, mm -hmm. as much because uh I, I mean, I've had shows all over the world canceled. Um, wow. I've had uh, uh, a few gigs in Montreal, up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, Vancouver, uh, down to Texas and Florida. I had uh, a lower run scheduled for Oktoberfest over in Germany uh, wow. in September and a couple shows in England uh, at the beginning of November. And mm -hmm. all that's gone. So, hmm. and I've never been outside of the country, or let me say, off this continent. Okay. So I was looking forward to going over there and, and performing. Right. And uh, that's dead in the water. But um, the last three years, uh, I've lost my mother, my sister, and my brother oh, wow. each of the last three years, or in a brother, rather, um, each of the last three years. So, um, you know, I, I did come into this year saying, okay, it's going to be different. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, my fresh new attitude. And we're going to get through this. Everything's going to be good. 2020 is my year. And then the whole world just. <laughs> wow. So I'm looking at it as, you know, as long as I don't lose another uh, family member, another sibling, uh, I'll see it as a blessing. You know, yeah. Do this, I'll see it as a blessing. Yeah, I was amazed that that, that you, uh, you know, telling telling us that you were a child of seventeen children. Oh yeah, that's oh, yeah. woo. Yeah, my uh, <laughs> that's a big thing. Time. Yeah, well, here's the thing, though, and, and I tell people this all the time. Uh, yeah, I recognize I was in a large family, and uh, and all, but it was seamless. My mother mm -hmm. had control over all of us, you know, and. Um, as beautiful and as lovely and as kind and, and soft-spoken as my mother was, uh, she had the gift of the strap, you know. She can pick up a shoe, a belt, a switch, whatever, <laughs> and put us in line. And you had right. to, you know, you had to. Um, and, and we all, we're all good people. I, my siblings, are they're, they're good human beings. And my mother did, you know, primarily by herself. So, wow. um, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. And now, I mean, she had you know, I had my, my oldest sister who passed away and uh, my eldest brother, who was like a father to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they helped groom us, but uh, I was also blessed enough to be raised by my uh, best friend's uh, parents. You know, okay. I had, I, my, the people in my camp, the people that helped shape me and raise me and, and make sure I, I did right. Um, it's a large group of people. Uh, there was a community that went into this. Uh, well, you, had, you, had you had a real village. Have, pardon me? You had a real village. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. I could have easily gotten into all kinds of trouble, you know? I mean, it was around us. But right. I didn't, you know, I didn't go that route. So I'm thankful for it. Yeah, that's what's up. How did you, um, how did you get into comedy? Was that something always kind of circling around you or? Oh, boy. Uh, well, I, I've always thought that I was funny. And okay. I guess to be a comedian, you have to at least believe that you're funny. True. Um, and I can remember the very first joke I've ever, I ever told. We were watching the news, and I was maybe seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, my eldest sister, uh, she, she's five years older than me. She's the one that passed away. Okay. Um, you know, so she's 13. And I remember watching the news and they were talking about the president and the White House. And I was like, I know why they call it the White House because they won't have to let a black person in it. And she laughed. And <laughs> I never heard my sister laugh, you know, like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I think I'm funny. So I just started acting. So, I mean, you have to try to find your spot. Right. Some kids, you know. And um, my sisters, they sing. And my brother, you know, they're artists and they can work on cars and uh, and, and they had all of these talents and, and not that I didn't have other talents but I wanted to do something that was different from that mm -hmm. I was also very shy and I'm still to a certain degree what? Little, oh yeah yeah a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. and um, what, I, what I started to realize was if I can make people laugh um, that would calm me down it would also uh, allow me to see what kind of people they are, what kind of personality they had. So I started making kids laugh in my classroom and it just continued on, you know? And um, my uh, uh, soon to be ex uh, for my birthday, 43rd birthday, got me uh, classes at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. Uh, yeah. comedy class. And um, and yeah, I, as soon as I stepped on stage, I had been on stage before acting and singing and stuff, but as soon as I stepped on stage to do comedy, it was it. It was game over. That's all really? I ever wanted to do. Oh, yeah. That's all I ever wanted to do. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever had a um, a horrible time on stage? Or let me ask you this. What was your, your best stage time and your worst? I'll go with the worst first. Okay. <laughs> um, one of my sisters. Uh, wanted me to perform for her church for a uh, a fall a harvest celebration, mm -hmm. which is code for Halloween for right. all of the pagans out there. 
<laughs> that are white church. That's cool. And I was under the uh, impression that I would be in an auditorium type of thing and people would, you know, they'd have other functions going on, but there would be a set aside time for me to perform. Right. And um, what ended up happening was um, I was at this, it was this old school and they had this huge gym. This gym was huge. There were like four basketball courts in this gym. And the stage was way up above the floor. And at the opposite end of the stage was the biggest bounce house I had ever seen. I think it's the biggest bounce house in Guinness Book Record. This thing was the size of the Silver Dome. It was huge. Wow. And, um, it was huge. And there were kids bouncing in that thing like popcorn. It was crazy. <laughs> but they also had the basketball courts open. So you had a couple kids playing a couple games of basketball. And they had stations around it so kids could go basically trick-or-treating to get candy okay. uh, at these different stations. And the parents were sitting off on the wall in chairs uh, next to the wall. And no one was really paying attention to me. They had a DJ who was DJ and he introduces me. And I come out there and there was uh, one kid who I believe was learning disabled. I believe he was. Mm -hmm. He paid attention to the whole time I was performing. He was the only one who paid attention. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and it was noisy and no one was paying attention to me and people would stop and look at me like basically what is he doing and walk away and after the end of my set I'm like okay I'm done with this uh, after the end of my set the kid comes up to me he goes he pats me on my shoulder he goes that was good and then walks away <laughs> and I'm like oh this is the worst wow the worst one person ever. and I go to my sister afterwards I'm like look man next time you want someone to entertain in a situation like that, get a clown. This, <laughs> right. is, not, this is not for comedians at all. <laughs> and I walked out to my car and I sat in my car for a minute and I couldn't do anything but laugh. I mean, what can you do? Wow. So that was the worst. Okay. That was the worst. Um, the best had to be the uh, Heart of the City taping with Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. That was magical. That wow. there was something. There was something about being there with uh, with Jay Bell and Boogie and, and and Jeff Horst, and just the whole day was. It was emotional. It, it was it was it was unreal. It was surreal. It was surreal. Wow. And to be able to, to sit, you know, three feet from Kevin Hart, and just go. The whole time he's talking, I'm going, huh, that's Kevin Hart. <laughs> and, and I wasn't fanboying. I was just like, okay. I like I just playing the whole scene with him walking or running down the stairs and climbing up on the platform with us. And then later on that night performing, and it was a packed room. And my my three oldest kids and my ex were sitting in front row. And I didn't know that. So when I went on stage and I grabbed the mic, I looked down and I see them. And for a second, I pause. My brain goes, oh, snap. <laughs> this is in the front row. And then I'm like, okay, let me get to it. And the first joke I told, the room is very low ceilings. I don't know if you've been to the um, uh, the music, the jazz cafe. Yeah. Music hall. Okay. Yeah. So it was in there. Oh, okay. But, but we were we had to hide out basically where they had their whole setup for their the monitors and everything, the producers. Yeah. And when we walked out of the, the main auditorium, we had to walk through the uh, uh, walk through the uh, the main entryway. Right. Before you went down into the jazz cafe. And it was packed. We didn't know this. Wow. It was packed. Front to back people from the door to <coughs> to the curtain was packed and when we walked through people were already cheering wow. and it was just like okay and then you walk down a little flight of stairs there's a hallway yeah another flight of stairs leads you down to where the uh, jazz cafe is right and we had to wait in the hallway and the shirt that i wore was this red it was a custom made shirt i thought i was killing it i don't know why i had a hat on <laughs> I, I, I never performed with a hat before that night Okay. On stage. And I'm like, the reason why I wore the hat was it was so hot in there. 
and I was concerned about sweating. Okay. Because the shirt, I mean, it would just bleed through. And wow. I didn't want that to show up on like, oh man, he's nervous. I wasn't nervous, I was excited, but it was hot. And right. I, you know, I was much bigger than I am now. So I stood there with my arms out like this. <laughs> <laughs> and hand to God, whenever I'm hot, I always think penguin toes, penguin toes, penguin toes. Because I always tell people I'm penguin toes cool. And that's how cool I was. You can't be colder than penguin toes. So right. I'm penguin toes, penguin toes. And I'm standing there like this the whole time, and I'm not moving. And the, the producer lady was like, okay, you're up next. I'm like, okay. She goes, are you ready? Yeah. She's like, are you nervous? I'm like, no, I'm not nervous. And I just stood there and waited. And I try to calm myself and breathe. And they introduced me, Howie Bell, Detroit legend, love that cat. He, he was hosting a show. He okay. introduces us. And we had a narrow walkway, L-shaped, boom, boom, up to the stage. Right. And as I'm walking through the crowd, it's packed in there. Front wall to wall. We go up to the I go up to the stage, I grab the mic, I see my family. And then I look up and there's Kevin Hart and Joey Wells and uh uh, uh Goodsby, Harry, Goodsby sitting there above the crowd a little bit. And the first joke that I told, I see Kevin Hart. Oh wow, that's and dope. I was like, my brain goes, oh, man, Kevin Hart is laughing at one of your jokes. <laughs> and then my other side of my brain was like, uh, boy, keep going. And I kept going. <laughs> and I went over my time. And uh, I didn't care because I'm like, I'm never going to get this opportunity again. Thank they have enough care. material now to use for the show. Right. And um, the thing that they used uh, wasn't a joke I thought they were going to use. But I'm glad that they used it. Yeah. So... Anyway, that was my best time. I know it went long, but that's awesome, though. That's man, that's a great opportunity. It, it was a blessing, and the whole night, I, that feeling—I can't speak for the other guys, but for me, that went on for weeks. And, wow! And it came after a very uh, difficult time because my mother had just passed away. Okay. Uh, she passed away in July, and once my mother passed away, I'm like, I don't even want to do comedy anymore. Uh, this was in 2017. I don't want to do comedy anymore. I don't feel like being funny. I don't feel like doing this. I'm just done. I'm done. And um, I had auditioned for the show back in March. And I uh, hadn't heard anything from them. Nothing. I'm driving with my daughter, my youngest daughter. And I get a phone call from one of Kevin Hart's people. And... Um, they're like, hey, I'm blah, 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 Heart of the City, Kevin Hart. You were picked for the show. I'm like, okay. And she goes, all right, I need you to send me your social security number. So because we have to get the paperwork prepared for the, um, uh, to get paid and, and for the, um, uh, to get into the uh, screen actors and all that sag and stuff like that. Right. And I'm like, well, okay, I'm driving right now. I can't text you anything. Let me pull over and I'll text you. So I'll pull over and my daughter, who at the time she was eight, she, mm -hmm. goes, she goes, Dad, don't fall for it. It's a scam. I saw it on <laughs> I saw it on Dateline or something like that. I'm like, yeah, it could be a scam. That's right. And I'm like, but if I made it, I'm pretty sure Jeff Horse made it. So I called Jeff. Yo, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. And what's going on? Jeff goes, it's legit. Send them in. I was like, okay. So I immediately texted to him. Didn't hear from him for weeks. Wow. After that. And then all of a sudden, we just started getting emails. This is where you'll be. Bring these clothes. Da, da, da. And then it was on and rolling. And that is it, so dope. Yeah. And, and I didn't perform. That was the first time I performed since my mother passed. So yeah. I was trying to get my head back into the game and, and, and to, you know, get ready to perform. And it wasn't, it, it was difficult. At mm -hmm. least I thought it was going to be. But once I got on stage, it was just like, boom, 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 boom. And uh, that's the, that's the director's cut <laughs> of that <laughs> <night>. <laughs> Angela Davis said you were surrounded by great. I, I was. It's, Angela, you're absolutely correct. I could not have, um, 
we we talked about it before the the taping uh, when we had to go in and show our outfits, and we just finished doing our interview with Kevin Hart. Well, we had hours before our performance part, and so we walked around. We went to a cigar shop. We got some, you know, Jay Bell got some cigars. We're sitting there talking and stuff about how much of a blessing it was. And my mother would always tell us, my dad would too, that what's meant for you, nobody else is going to have. Right. You know, and and I kept saying, this is this is our fraternity. This is a fraternity of four people. No one else in Detroit is going to do it. If they do it again, it'll be after us. But we're the first to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no one could have. Even if Kevin Hart's son said, Dad, I want a spot on the Detroit show, he wouldn't have been able to have You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I always look at things that way because then it keeps me from being disappointed when I don't get an opportunity mm -hmm. or, or being bothered by it. Um, if it's not meant for me, it wasn't meant for me to have. So I can't get upset about it, you know? Right. And, um, and I, I firmly believe those, the four guys that were picked, uh, it was for us and um, not saying we're the funniest, not saying we're the best, but we're the four best for that opportunity. And uh, it's, it's a blessing. I, every day, I, I swear, I have some reminder of it every day of my life. That's and what's up. I'll take it to my grave. I want them to throw my my lanyard around my neck in my basket. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go with me, you know. So a uh, couple of questions. Uh, we have a question from uh, a viewer. And um, I was wanting to know, as a comedian, how do you cope with rough times in life, which kind of plays along with what her question is. Angela's asking, how do you do a show when you're sad or not in the mood? Oh, Angela, that's a fantastic question. And, um, and I don't want to say fortunately, but I've been given opportunities uh, to prove that out. Uh, my mother passed away in July of 2017. My okay. older sister passed away almost a year to the day later. Wow. And the day we buried my sister, I had a show that night. Oh, no. Yeah, it was already booked for months, and I couldn't back out. And um, so I buried my sister, went home, took a nap, got dressed. My uncles who came up from down south, my siblings and all, decided to come out to that show. And, uh, I mean, I'm upset. This is my, she's like my second mother. Right. And um, the show was beautiful. I, I had my buddy, uh, J.R. Williams and Big Cam, you know, Big Cam Row. Uh, uh, they opened, yeah, they were my openers. And the room was already packed because they had a fundraiser there. My family came in and took up 35 seats. It was packed to the gills, and yeah. it was emotional. And, and I explained to the people why it was emotional, and and I was glad my family was there to help hold me up because I don't think I would have been able to do it without them. Um, but the bottom line was, you know, my mother always told me, um, never get too high, never get too low. Mm -hmm. and as low as I was when she passed, I had a, a the biggest high in my comedy career doing the heart of the city. As long right. as I was with my sister passing, now I can go back to how I felt with my mother and, and the heart of the city situation and go, okay, I'm, I'm here to perform. Let me knock this out of the way and I can go back to grieving afterwards. But my job is to help other people uh, be happy and, and have laughs and feel good. Um, because in doing comedy, I've met some people, I mean, I've met people that I've lost a spouse, lost a child, lost a parent. Yeah. Um, I've had a, a situation where I was over in Canada doing um, a little show for a buddy, and a girl uh, came up to me afterwards uh, and was told she was losing her hearing in her other She already lost hearing in one ear. Wow. She was losing the hearing in her other ear. Mm -hmm. And um, she wanted to laugh one last time. And she heard me perform. I had gout that night. <laughs> I had a gout attack. I didn't want to perform. I almost dropped out of the show. Wow. Um, but I decided to do it anyway. And the girl told me this. And when she left, I drove home. I left like immediately after my set. And she yeah. called me before I left. And I cried all the way home because this woman's about to lose her hearing. And she wanted to laugh. And 
me? I, you know, she's like, she saw there was comedy happening and a few days earlier and she decided to drop in, came by herself, laughed, went home. And, um, you know, I've had a situation where these people brought their friends. She, she had brain cancer and she only had a few days left and they brought her out to hang out and they didn't even know comedy was happening there. And it's been going on at that particular place for 30 years. So by yeah. happenstance, they looked in the paper and saw that there was a comedy show and all decided to come there. So I, I'm a firm believer that comedy is, is healing. Yeah. Uh, comedy is power. It's, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And I'd never take any opportunity I get on stage. I, I give 100% because I don't know who's out there hurting. I don't know who's having a bad life. Um, I just know how I felt when those people told me that and I go each and every time I perform, I, I go ham. That's what's up. That's deep though. Yeah. It, That's... I get emotional about this stuff, man. I, yeah. I, I, sometimes I come home and I'm just like, I'm exhausted because it's just, you know, of all the people that and you feel the vibes and spirits and stuff and, and of the people in the crowd coming up to you and they're hurting and all that. And you're able to give them 45 minutes, an hour, Right. You know, uh, to take their minds off of it. it. That's amazing. That's amazing. It is. It is. And I hate when comics, you know, I hate when comics talk crap about it too, about comedy. I know it's not the best situation at all times, but I'm not in it to be rich. I'm in it to perform and, and, and show my talent. If money comes, it comes. But that's not my driving force. Not my, not me personally. It's just not. I love that. I can I can tell that it's it's something that you're really truly passionate about. It's it's so funny. I I was trying to see you live so many times. It, I really was, and my schedule was just sometimes it would just be like, nope, that's not gonna happen. Right. And the one the one and I kept telling you I was like, I'm coming, I'm coming, and right. and I wouldn't be able to make it. The one time that I was like, I'm not even gonna say anything. I'm just gonna show up. You had an emergency or something with your daughter, and you weren't able to be there. But it's okay. I met a couple of comedians, some other comedians that night, and the burgers and fries was the bomb. So you know, but, but I really was trying. I was trying, and then we were trying to get on, get you on the podcast before when I had just the audio version. But our schedules just wasn't working. No. Um, no I'm sure. and, but I can I can tell that it's something that that is really you're really into it and you love what you do. And it's not just, you know, I'm trying to get a dollar here or $2 there. It's really something that you love period. And that's, that's why, that's why I was really impressed with you. Um, you know, your CD is great. You, you, you talk about life. You talk about family, you always talk about your kids. And, you know, I just thought that was really great. That's why I really wanted to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And, and listen, I'm not knocking anyone's hustle. If, if this is how they're making their money and they they have to grind right. and comedy, then that's that's cool. And I hope to be in that position one day where comedy is is paying all of my bills. It's um, coming. It's coming, and from your mouth to God's ears, you know. Um, but I, I love this. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's what's up. So. Mike, as a kid, what did you, or if, if you weren't Amish or something, what did you watch on TV all the time? Well, Amish, yeah, basically we were. We were my mother tried to make us Amish. She made <laughs> us watch all these corny shows, corny ass shows. We, we were, my mother was all about the Waltons. Oh. All about the Waltons. <laughs> you know, um, we would watch that. We'd watch uh, Little House on the Prairie. We'd watch uh, Lawrence Welk. That was her thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Love Boat, Fantasy Island. We had to watch that, and all of her soap operas, all of General Hospital, and all my children. And Channel Seven, yeah, okay. Girl, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff. But my mother was hardcore about that Walton, and I think it's because she. <laughs> I want to talk about my mother a lot tonight because my mother gave okay. me a lot of like lessons. It's okay. Shout out to your mom. She she my did a great job. Shout out yeah. to Rosie B. Um, she would always tell us, be careful what you wish for, because she always prayed to God to have six boys because she grew up down in northern Mississippi on a huge plot of land. And her idea was she and my dad were going to have this farm and her boys were going to run this farm. 
So she always mm-hmm. said, be careful what you wish for. She wanted six boys. She got six boys, but she wow. also gave birth to eight girls. Woo! So I like to add a caveat to what she said. Be careful what you wish for and be very specific. Okay. Say so that when again. I wish for, <laughs> Say when that I again. Stuff, <laughs> when I pray for stuff, I'm like, oh, dear Lord, please let me be able to perform in this show in Paris, France, in front of 50,000 people, and all of them buy some of my merch, and I fly back home with a pocket full of money, and you know, stuff like that. I'm, I'm real specific, put it into my yeah. bank, put it into my credit union account, so my ex <laughs> won't find it, no, stuff like that. So, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, y'all, I'm just kidding. Oh, you so you are something else. So what um I noticed on your YouTube channel, which um everybody needs to check out his YouTube channel. Yes. You Thank do you. the motivational Mondays. Yes. And um I know it's probably been a minute since you did the last one. Yes. But I those are so dope. Thank you. I, what I, made, really what made you. I appreciate you saying that. I do. <laughs> I you do. know, it's, it's 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 crazy. It's like you say you say a lot of you know you say many things that you never know. Like you know the the famous thing people love to say is I don't know who need to hear this, but you know seriously, you you know you bring up great points. Especially I love the one about time and how you know how you like to have yourself on a schedule and you like to know what you're doing when you're gonna do it and all of that and how precious your time is. That and it's it was a great reminder because you know once your time once you lose the time it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. You know. And, and I I appreciate you saying that and and it has been a minute and I'll tell you why I did it. Um, I did it at the beginning of all of this uh, this COVID stuff mm-hmm. and because I found myself becoming depressed about. Mm. Like, okay, I can't perform anymore. We don't know how long this is going to last. Um, and at the time, I wasn't able to see my my youngest daughter uh, much at all because I was afraid I would get her sick. So right. I was right. very careful about quarantining myself and staying away from people. And I, I live right now with my buddy. Um, and in my room, I would just stay in my room. I wouldn't even come out of my room. Wow. I was that, like, freaked out about it. And... and afraid to get my daughter sick. Right. So, um, I was depressed, man. <laughs> I was depressed. Man. And, um, so I did the motivational thing to kind of lift me up. And and I, you know, I I, I go back and, and hearken to a lot of uh, uh, scripture. My dad was a, a preacher. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, he was a hustler first. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Then he became a preacher. Some people might say it's no different, but I'm not going to touch that. Oh. But uh, my pops um, always taught us scripture, and I just, different ones kept popping in my head. And um, so a little bit of what I talked about came from a scripture that my pop told us, or I read about her or something. And I didn't want to make it preachy, you know, like right. Bible says, you know, or whatever. I just want to say, hey, this is how I feel, my take, and how that applies to my life. And I'm going right. to translate it to whoever needs to hear. It. Right. Um, and yeah, so I, I do need to get back on it. Um, I'm not depressed anymore, people. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I found other outlets and, and other ways to be creative. Um, you know, I didn't go on the whole uh, Zoom comedy shows and all that stuff. Um, I just didn't feel, I didn't feel into it. Mm-hmm. And, um, the first show I had back, uh, Mike Ball, who's a local uh, comedian and producer, show producer, mm-hmm. down in Jackson, Michigan. And okay. They showed out. They showed out for that show, and I was petrified. Because you? Like, all of these Jeremy people, they don't like to put on masks. <laughs> right. <I get> it. <laughs> you know, and after the show, you think, okay, everybody dispersed, but people were coming up to you after the show, like, hey, hey bro, cool. <laughs> You know, six feet, man. Six feet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised how many people are like, they're, you know, they don't believe in that mask stuff. 
<laughs> no, not at all. It's a lot of them that they don't believe in that. They don't believe in being away from people. And, right. you know, I tell people every time I go live, I'm like, these masks, you know, uh, if, if I was sick and and, and uh, the, the computer was uh, able to catch a disease from me, they would catch it because I'd be spitting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, you got, I mean, we we got you know we have those Nubian lips is all I'm saying. <laughs> you know we're beatboxing all the time. Those all the time. Lips, you know that's how it goes. It's all the I'm time. Lips, but I'm with you. I'm with you. I I, yeah. um, I don't want to be rude to people, but I tell them, like, hey man, you know I, I got a kid at home. You know I don't want to be bringing stuff to her, and she has asthma and all, and uh, I don't want to do that. And, and I don't right. want to. Do I'm 51 years old. I know I don't look it. You know, if you. No, you no. Know, you know, shout out, like, shout out to Black Don't Crack. I'm just saying, I'm like 18 <laughs> if I do this. But, oh, uh, don't worry about that, <laughs> I'm not trying to get sick and I'm not trying to prove a point. Right. I'd much rather be like the people on the, uh, they say on the news when something breaks out, they always go interview. I want to be the guy they interview. Yeah, man, I saw everything that happened. The people <laughs> weren't wearing masks, they all died. Oh, Man, you know. <laughs> Speaking of um, not wanting to get your kids sick, um, I know you talk a lot about your children, and I, I love that when I, when parents talk about their kids and they love. You can see that they love their kids, which they're supposed to anyway, right? Um, <laughs> what is, what is um, what is parenting to you? Um, my best and greatest achievement. I've been a, a parent since I was 16. I started young. My oldest kid uh, will be 35 on Halloween. Wow. And, um, yeah. And I tell people that and and people, you know, they have their, uh, you know, they might say something about it one way or another. I don't care. I was able to raise my kids. Right. Um, I had my first three uh, by the time I was 23. Mm -hmm. And my youngest, she came along with my second wife, and um, I was 39. And um, the difference is when I had the first three, everything was reactive. I, I didn't plan anything because I knew it would always change. Something would change. So I never got, I never got married to an idea or to a plan because I mm -hmm. knew if my kids needed me, I'm canceling that and going to my kids. Um, but with this one, my 12 year old, I'm like, okay, I, I made it through all of that. You know, I made it through raising the first three and they're all great adults. They're all great, you know, human beings, mm -hmm. um, good people. And that's all my job is to raise, uh, good adults. And I always tell people that I've never raised kids. I've raised adults because God willing, they'll be adults much longer than they are kids. So right. I always spoke to my kids, like I'm speaking to you. Mm -hmm. Now, I might do some curse words here and there to really drive home the point. And, um, but my kids understood that I care about them and that I, I have their best interests at heart and so on. And um, they're, they're solid, you know, they're solid individuals, solid human beings. Um, but parenting is, that's it. I, you, you work on raising good adults. Um, good community minded, uh, empathetic, because I, I think the world, we're just missing out on empathy um, and loving people. And yeah. I kiss my sons on their foreheads still to this day. They hate it. They're <laughs> adult men. But I'm like, you're, my, you're still my baby. I don't care. I don't care what any other people say. Um, you know, I tell my kids I love them. I, I don't, I'm not, you know, it's, there's nothing weak about that. You know, yeah. it, in my family, my parents didn't have enough time to go around. By the time she got, my mother started out telling one that she loved him. She tired by the tenth one. So, now tell the rest of them. Right, right, right. <laughs> I love you. Pass that down. And by the time it, it was like that, that game telephone. By the time he gets to the last one, he's like, "Mama hates your guts." She was never born. I know. I can't believe it either. But that's what she said. You know. So um, it, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be a parent. Yeah. And to be perfectly honest, uh, I'm also glad that I have this 12-year-old daughter of mine and I keep all kinds of love and 
praise on her and I get her anything she wants because I want her to keep me out of the home. I'm not trying to go to go see her home. The other three, like I said, it was reactive. It's a little sketchy with those three. This one here, she already told me I could live in her in her pool house. Okay. Be like the Fresh Prince. <laughs> or blackish. It'll be like pops on blackish. And I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. Right. How do you um how do you deal with co-parenting? Um again, I, I have a belief about parenting that I don't know what a lot of people think about. I think parenting in, in a familial unit, um, <laughs> there are four relationships, important relationships. Uh, the mother to the child, the father to the child, the parents to the, to one another, and the, the family as a unit. And <laughs> you can have a good familiar relationship, but a, per, a parenting relationship or parent to child relationship could be fractured. There could be something flawed with that. And I and I, I say it that way because I think as parents, we each have individual responsibilities to our kid. We right. can't live off the good graces of the other parent. It's like, oh, your mother doing a hell of a job, and then I'm going to sit back with my arms folded and let my daughter do whatever she wants to do. I have to be involved in that. You know, I have, there's a, it, you know, parenting is, is, is a verb, you know, and so I, as far as co-parenting is, is concerned, I can have a conversation and we can talk and we can, um, we can disagree on things, but for the most part, I'm going to come to you with logic. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to you with, okay, I know our child. I know their, their pluses and minuses. I don't treat them all the same. I love them equally, but I don't mm -hmm. treat them the same because they each have different personalities and wants and needs. But then after that, your job as the mother is your responsibility. You have to make sure you foster a solid relationship with your child. I'm making sure that I foster one with our child. And then together as parents, we get on the same page and be on the same accord to raise our child together. Mm -hmm. so, so my daughter knows she can't sneak anything past me to her mother <laughs> and vice versa. Right. We're not playing that game. Yeah. No, even if we don't agree as parents, we talk it out and say, right. well, okay, how can we come to a medium, uh, a medium on this and then approach our daughter with it? That's what's up. In the, um, in the, in the comedy community, what is something you would like to see change? Oh boy, there are a bunch of <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll name like it's big ten. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, there, there definitely needs to be more outlets for comedy, um, legitimate outlets, not so much the bar shows because they don't pay a whole lot. Um, but legitimate, I mean, you all, you need to have different places. You need to have a, a minor league and a major league. And the major league are all the clubs. Would, that would be great. And I also would like these clubs to stop uh, focusing so much on young comics. Because I started out late. I started at 43. And it's hard for me to get into some certain clubs because they believe that the young, hot comic with the flannel shirt on and <laughs> talking about getting drunk and getting high and <laughs> you know, having sex, that's the funniest thing going. And I always tell, I've had people tell me, yeah, we would have you on the show, but we don't think that your material would translate. And I tell them, I, my material translates to everyone because I talk about everything. And older people can glean off what, I, what I'm talking about. Younger people can. And they both can understand how older people cope with things and younger people cope with things. Exactly, yeah. And, um, you know, but I've been blessed to, to have people actually look at my set and go, okay, dude, you're funny. I want you on my show. But I've had clubs tell me, nah, nah, we don't think it would translate to our younger crowd. Um, yeah. And that's just not true. It's not factual. Um, we need to give more opportunities to female comics. I, I know this has been said a million and one times, but um, we can uh, give a lot of opportunity to uh, – male comics who may not be as I want I don't want to say they're not funny because I don't want to get in the habit of saying someone's funny or not funny but they're mm -hmm. not as comedically talented as female comics that I've seen they can walk circles around some of these male comics yeah and, um, they don't get the opportunity because 
I think some of the in the it's a man's world. Well, that right. I mean, it's predominantly male, but also you, you also have to realize that a lot of the men that are in it are very socially awkward. Hmm. So they don't know how to deal with a female, with a woman. Let me not say female, with a woman. They don't know how to deal with it. I, I and that's just I've seen it. They, wow. they freeze up, they tense up, they don't know. Well, okay, can I say this? Can I say that? Because of, you know the whole. I'm like just talk like you would your mother. <laughs> right, right. You know, if you unless you talk to your mama wrong, you know. Right, right. <laughs> you know, if you're going in there speaking speaking slick, that's all yeah. you. I, I I could never do that. I could. I just you know. And I think that's the advantage of being older, getting into this at mm -hmm. the time that I did, because I was already raised. I, I know how to handle you know women. I know how to deal with people. I know how to talk and have a conversation. I'm not mm -hmm. you know socially awkward um but there are a lot of socially awkward people and they don't know how to handle it so they much yeah. rather not deal with it than you know get 20 of their friends who aren't as funny that's interesting wow so jervis canty said he'd love for the established comedians to start embracing the newer comedians a little more worldwide absolutely. not just locally uh, absolutely you're, that's one hundred percent true, and, and I think it comes down to um, the older comedians, more established comedians. Some of them, I'm not going to say all of them, because I've had some established comedians accept me uh, fully. And I, but I also think they did because of my age. I'm not a kid, so the things that we talk about, I'm talking at their level, you know. Mm -hmm. we're seeing that eye on. But I think a lot of established comedians don't. Um, they don't like to, to deal with a lot of younger ones because they think like, okay, um, this person is proven, you know, this person's here to take my spot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I try my best to work with younger dudes, female, I, women, I don't care. I try my best to do that. Um, I, one time I had six shows running and I would book anybody and everybody. And I was booking a lot of, uh, a lot of the ladies to headline my shows and I always try to put at least one on a show. Now I know people can call that tokenism one way or another, but the women in our, I was putting on my show were as funny, if not funnier than the men. Mm -hmm. that I had on my show. And I did it for, for that reason, because as soon as I came in, I noticed there aren't a whole lot of opportunities for women in, in the scene. So at least I, tr I tried to make opportunities. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because I noticed, you know, I just started out myself. And um, well, I told you when I first um when I first went on stage and it, it's 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 super exhilarating. It is yeah. it feels really good. And but I, I I have experience what Jervis was talking about where you, you don't feel accepted into that genre of creativity. And it's just like what like <laughs> You know, it it is it, like a catch twenty two. Like, what's going on? But you still want to do it. But it, you know, it's just it's it's different. It's different. And the flip side of that too, to that point, and in all fairness to the more established comedians, think about how many comedians or how many people who started in comedy or took off in comedy and said, "Okay, I'm going to be a comedian," went mm -hmm. hard at it and then just fizzled. Yeah, like disappear. It, comedians are like lawyers. I mean, there's a new batch. I mean, the comedy <laughs> are churning out a new batch every six to eight weeks. Yeah, um, people are picking up the mics all over the place. New people. I every every year I do this thing called uh, Fifty First Jokes. It's at the Ark in Ann Arbor. Uh, Shelly Smith, shout out to Shelly Smith. Uh, she organizes it, and it's uh, fifty comedians, fifty ish comedians. And the very first joke, you've never told it before in front of anyone. You go up on stage, and you have like two minutes to tell this joke. Yeah. Or tell your jokes. And every time I do it, the number of people that I recognize and know mm -hmm. compared to the number of people or new people who are participating. Okay. And I'm just like, who's that? Who are they? I don't I don't know. And and a lot of it is because I'm not in the area a lot. I don't perform in Detroit much at all. 
I'm all over everywhere else. Yeah, you you but, be you be on you be in Timbuktu, Mars, yeah. Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm performing for Inuits. I'm performing for nudists. I'm performing. I perform for anybody anywhere. I don't care, and I That's like true. traveling, so this fits my lifestyle. But I don't perform a lot in the area, and because of that, I'm not as tied into the scene. The Michigan scene, yes, but the Detroit scene, not so much. So when I I meet a new person, I try to engage, and but then I also have to keep in the back of my head that you know usually these people are much younger. They don't want to talk to me. They want to talk to their friends. You know, mm-hmm. it's a very nervous night and, and it's exciting, and they want to be with their friends. So I don't yes. think I'm to it. You know, so that's the other side of it all is that right. there are so many new comics that are coming and going. It is. It, it's, it's hard it's to get so attention. I don't even I you know even though I'm new I don't I'll be like well what is, you know people are like well you know so and so and you know so and so and I'll be like no I don't <laughs> like, I don't know none of them <laughs> no, no. yeah Shout out to all the new ones I don't know I'm sitting yeah. on a big hug a virtual hug but <laughs> what kind of right. yeah <laughs> I'm out here making this thriller I ain't got time for you <laughs> So, Mike, what um, what kind of advice would you give to a new comic? What what's a couple of things you would definitely throw their way? Some nuggets. Um, write every single day, whether mm. it's a, a word, a funny word, uh, a line, or an entire joke. Write every single day. Take five ten minutes to write. Um, don't throw away anything because what won't work right now. Something will happen in the world. You go, ah, man, I could have used that for that. And I've soul train scramble board jokes all the time. The, I, I'll tell a joke here, and something will happen. It's like, oh, it fits better here. And boom. Okay. It's, it's new life. So write every single day, uh, at least 10, 15 minutes. Uh, don't throw away any jokes. Um, be respectful to the game, man. Be respectful to everybody you meet. Don't be a jerk. Because let me tell you about being a jerk. Okay. You come in there trying to be hard or think you're funnier than everybody else and you start popping off and, and all that, nobody will mess with you. And you can only get gigs if you network. Well, if no one wants to network with black you. Blacklisted. <laughs> Blacklisted, black bowl, black hair, all the blacks. That's what you be. And, and it's easy to be. Listen, when I came in, like you said, no one wanted to talk to you. Think about me. I'm 43 years old. I'm in there with 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids, and they've already been at this for two, three, four years. Yeah. And I'm just now starting out. So they're looking at me like a narc, you know, like, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, hey, everybody, I've never in my life been an outsider. I've been I'm captain of the football team, I'm popular in school. I've always been that dude. Now I'm not that dude. They thought so you were under cover ball. Dude. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike. You know, they're like, yeah, dog. <laughs> I got kids your age. No, especially no. Hell no. <laughs> and that's how I felt. And, and, until, and until I established myself and they saw that I was really about this work and about becoming better, and uh, I was traveling all over the place early on doing it, that's when they're like, okay, this guy's cool and he's funny. And it's like a cool uncle. And that's the vibe that I want. I'm okay. Just, I'm just a cool uncle to anybody. I, I call a lot of these younger comics, you know, several of them, I call them my nephews. And because I feel that way towards them. And mm-hmm. they come to me with personal stuff, personal life stuff, you know. And I've helped out, you know, some comics financially. Uh, so I'm blessed to have a good day gig. Um, and I want to see them succeed. And if I see right. them on the grind and if I can help in any way, I'm going to help them. So, um that's my role in this and That's whatever good. whatever comes of it comes of it so don't be a jerk right don't throw away anything don't be a jerk to people and perform you're never going to get better unless you get on stage this True. whole idea of i'm funny i'm funny i'm funny and nobody sees you how they know you're funny how they know you're funny yeah you know that's the whole getting biblical putting your talents you know uh, you hiding your candles under a bushel you know you can't no one can see your light. Who right. cares? That's you know, right. go out there and shine those talents. So if you're on stage all the time, 
that means you're forced to network. If you're forced to network, you can't go in there talking trash. Don't get caught up in all of that, all that jibber jabber and gossiping and all that. Who says you know this, that, and the other? I'm all outside. I'm about this comedy. When they start, you know, getting into these clicks and stuff, I'm like the Black Ferris Bueller. I can be in this click. I can be in that click. I'm cool with these folks. I'm cool with those folks. Nobody can say I'm talking trash about them because that's just not my. I'm not. I'm not there to do that. That's what's up. That's what's up. But that comes with maturity. Yeah, definitely. You know? Definitely. Well, I enjoyed talking to you. I know your I'm time. Glad we're finally able to do it. I know, right? I'm like, man, what is really going on? Right, right. Had to wait for Corona. That's that's yeah, that's COVID positive. We're right. gonna say that. We're gonna turn it into a good thing. Right. It's COVID positive. Right. Good stuff happening here. Yeah. I appreciate definitely. everybody uh, sending in questions and stuff. Uh, I hope they get a chance to follow me. Uh, tag me if you're a comedian. I'll follow you back. Um, it's all about love, man. It's all about love. And if I, show, I can get people on, I'll put you on. You know, at least try to. And make sure you check out his website, which is yes. michaelpeter.com. Please check out the Charm Offensive. Some funny shit. Okay. I know it looks like I know it looks like I, I'm getting ready to play like a jazz flute or something with that picture on the front. Because I was looking at it like, oh, that picture looks tough, but it looks like I'm about to go Naji and stuff. It's not. Good jokes. <laughs> yes, it's Good very jokes very funny. funny. Uh, check him out on YouTube and, you know, keep it going. Keep it going. Don't stop what you're doing. I appreciate Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you, too. God bless. Thank you again for having me. This is you awesome. are welcome. I appreciate Anytime. it. Any Wednesday night. I'll okay. Be, All right. Don't, 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 COVID's over. Might start a Wednesday comedy show uh, banter or something. There you go. There you go. Okay. All right, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. All right. Take care. We'll see you. Thank you for watching and make sure you send any inquiries to info at experience.com. Comedy is life.